Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Michael Chambers? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, then I'll move to my analysis. In 2017, 70-year-old Michael Chambers lived in Quinlan, Texas, with his wife, Rebecca Chambers. She went by the name Becca. She was his second wife. They married in 1980. Michael had two daughters from a previous marriage, and he and Becca adopted two boys. Michael had been a firefighter for many years. He retired in 2008. Becca worked as a home health aide. Michael was active in his retirement. He restored classic cars and attended car shows regularly. He had a detached garage on his property where he would perform work on the vehicles. On March 10, 2017, at 8 a.m., Becca spoke to Michael on the phone and asked him to buy her mascara at the store. Michael drove to a nearby Walmart and purchased the mascara. He was captured on video surveillance entering the store, making the purchase, walking out of the store, and driving out of the parking lot in his truck. He left the store at about 11.15 a.m. It did not appear as though anyone was following him. It is believed that Michael arrived back at his house before noon, but this sighting at 11.15 a.m. was the last time he would ever be seen. Becca Chambers returned home at about 6.15 p.m. She said that she had texted Michael when she was on her way and she received no reply. When she arrived home, she claimed that his truck was in the driveway and the garage door was closed. Both the house and the garage were locked and all the lights were off. She searched the house and found a Walmart bag with mascara in it on the bathroom counter, but no sign of Michael. At 6.55 p.m., Becca reported him missing to the police. Here's what the police found during their investigation. In the detached garage, there were quarter-sized drops of blood on the floor that continued from the middle of the garage to the garage door. It was a small amount of blood, not consistent with a fatality. The police later confirmed that the blood was Michael's. A wooden dowel was found in the garage. It had Michael's blood on a part of it, as if it had struck him. A bicycle and a tarp were missing from the garage. Michael's truck keys and wallet were found in the garage. His credit cards were there, but all the cash was missing along with his driver's license. Michael's cell phone was also missing. There was no sign of a struggle in the garage. Michael had a 12-gauge shotgun, which was still there. It had not been touched. He had a number of expensive tools that had not been touched either. In Michael's truck, the police found about $1,000 in cash in the center console. The police studied Becca's cell phone records. They realized that she was having an affair. She made five work calls in the morning at 2.20 p.m., she called an affair partner. The partner returned the call at 2.53 p.m. and called her again at 3.08 p.m. From 3.15 to 4.51 p.m., her phone was off. After the phone came back on, Becca placed a few calls to Michael's daughter and son before calling Michael's phone two times. The police also tracked activity on Michael's phone. They were able to determine where it had been based on studying transmissions to cell towers. They noticed that before noon, on the day he went missing, the phone traveled to a bridge referred to as the Two Mile Bridge. Presumably, at this point, Michael was in possession of his phone, because this was prior to his disappearance. At about 2.30 p.m., the phone traveled back to that same bridge. Its last known location was in the middle of the bridge. This was at 5.53 p.m. The average speed at which the phone was moving was only 4.2 miles per hour. So as it moved from Michael's residence to that bridge, it was going too fast for walking, but too slow for driving. The police wondered if Michael's bicycle may have been used to transport the phone. Again, Michael's bicycle was missing from the garage. The police investigated a number of individuals to determine if they were connected to Michael's disappearance. They thought that one of Michael's adopted sons, Justin, could have been involved. His relationship with his father was strained, but Justin was at work during the time of the disappearance, and his alibi 
was confirmed. Becca Chambers modified the family cell phone plan on March 20. She suspended service on Michael's phone and removed Justin's phone. One would think that she would want to keep Michael's phone active because that phone was missing. So if he was somewhere and needed help and wanted to call her, he would be able to do it. Of course, with the phone deactivated, he could still call 911. Becca petitioned the court on April 20 to have Michael declared dead. He was declared dead on May 26. This gave Becca access to Michael's assets and death benefits. She sold his truck and a late 1960s Ford Mustang that Michael had restored and given to her as a gift. She eventually sold his entire car collection, moved out of the house, and listed the house for sale. The police interviewed Becca Chambers. She admitted to having multiple affairs throughout the marriage, but denied being involved in Michael's disappearance. She said that she believed Michael knew that she was having an affair, but he never confronted her about it. I guess it just never came up in conversation. The police also interviewed her lover. He denied any involvement in Michael's disappearance as well. The police eventually cleared Becca and her lover of being involved. Michael Chambers has not been found, despite extensive searches in the area. The police believe that Michael disappeared sometime between noon and 3.30 p.m., but they do not know how or why. Now moving to my analysis. There are essentially only two theories about what could have happened to Michael Chambers. Either he was the victim of foul play, or he staged his disappearance and brought an end to his own life. The latter theory is the one that the police believe is the best explanation. Now one could argue a third possibility, he staged his own disappearance and left to start a new life, but that is extremely unlikely, particularly at 70 years old. Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the staged disappearance theory. So this is the theory that he staged his own disappearance and then brought an end to his life. Starting with the evidence that supports this theory. There was no sign of a struggle in the garage or in the surrounding area. The only items missing were his cell phone, his driver's license, a small amount of cash, his bicycle, and a tarp. Valuable items were left behind, like a 12 gauge shotgun, many automotive tools, Michael's vehicles, and about $1,000 in cash inside his truck. Both the house and the garage were locked. All the lights were off. Only very courteous murderers remember to turn off the lights and lock the door. The small amount of blood on the floor formed a peculiar pattern. The quarter-sized drops of blood were nearly perfectly circular. The blood was also bright red, which suggests it had been mixed with an anticoagulant. This makes it seem as though the blood had been drawn in advance and stored, then dropped on the floor neatly. Michael's cell phone was tracked to a bridge earlier in the day and then tracked to that same bridge later on. The signal disappeared in the middle of the bridge. The most likely person to be in possession of Michael's phone was Michael. If a killer had taken the phone, why would they make their way back to the exact same place that Michael had been earlier in that day? And why would they ride Michael's bicycle to that location? Michael's wife had multiple affairs during their marriage. She was actively having an affair when Michael died. Perhaps Michael was depressed about this activity. Maybe he was just tired of all the affairs. According to Michael's son-in-law, two months before Michael went missing, he and Michael were watching a true crime television show. Michael turned to him and talked about how a person could stage their own disappearance and no one would ever find them. The police claimed that Michael had severe depression, but they did not reveal how or why they believed this. Now moving to the factors that contradict this theory. Cash was missing out of Michael's wallet. Michael was friendly. He would often leave the garage door open when he was working on cars. It would not be unusual for people to stop by and talk to him. Perhaps he trusted the wrong person. There was a small amount of Michael's blood on the floor and on the wooden dowel. It's not unusual for evidence like that to be associated with a crime. Most people find that keeping their blood inside their body is more consistent with remaining alive. Some people who knew Michael said he could only stand up for about a half hour. He had two bad knees. There was no way he could have ridden a bicycle for over three hours. No one saw Michael riding to the bridge that day or on the bridge. 
The bridge is only about 5 to 20 feet from the water. A fall from that height into the water would not cause death, although someone, of course, could still drown after entering the water. It's worth noting that the police initially believed that Michael went into the water, but based on various locations they've searched, it seems clear they also believe his body could be somewhere on land. When considering the evidence, do I think that the police are correct? Is the staged disappearance theory the best explanation? Yes, I think the evidence supports the idea that Michael staged his own disappearance. Here's what I think happened in this case. This is just a theory, my opinion. Michael was enjoying his retirement initially, but one or more stressors appeared in his life, including the fact that his wife was having an affair and had participated in multiple affairs. Michael's relatives indicated that he cared about Becca deeply and treated her like a princess. If he only recently learned about the affairs, he may have been devastated. I find it difficult to believe that he knew about the current affair and simply never confronted Becca. Like he just went on as if nothing was wrong. Perhaps Michael's retirement also contributed to him being despondent. Retirement can be challenging for anyone, but especially people who highly identify with their careers. Typically, first responders fall into this category. Some firefighters view their work as more than a job. Rather, they look at it like a purpose in life. Michael grew increasingly depressed under the weight of the stress and planned his exit, but he wanted to get some type of revenge on his way out. He knew that if he went missing under suspicious circumstances, everyone would find out about his wife's infidelity. The more mysterious the disappearance was, the more it looked like it could be a crime, the more attention would be paid to his wife. Before noon on March 10, Michael scouted out a location near the Two Mile Bridge, which was only about five or six miles from where he used to live. So this was an area that was familiar to him and may have had some type of sentimental value. He staged an abduction by placing his blood on the garage floor and on the wooden dowel. He mustered up all the strength he could, fought through the pain in his knees, and rode his bicycle farther than anyone thought he could. He used a bicycle so that none of his vehicles would be missing. Therefore, people would assume he was abducted. Perhaps he didn't realize the police would notice that the bicycle was missing or that they could track his cell phone. As he was crossing the two-mile bridge, he deactivated his phone or threw it off of the bridge. This explains why his body was never found in the water. Perhaps he never went into the water at all. He just kept riding his bicycle. When he reached his desired location, near the bridge, he ended his life in a manner such that his body would never be found. Prior to this, he hid the bicycle as well. Perhaps the tarp played a part in his plan, like it was used to conceal his body and or the bicycle. Now moving to my final thoughts. When a person goes missing and their body is never found, it does not take a lot of evidence to convince people foul play is involved. Michael Chambers did a fairly obvious job of staging a crime scene, yet many people believed that he was murdered. A missing body creates a lack of evidence to examine. Any evidence that is available is processed as being more meaningful in the void of knowledge that was created. Small details appear to be disproportionately significant. People interpret the details as carrying more weight. They incorrectly believe that a conclusion must be drawn as easily from a small amount of evidence as it can be from a large amount of evidence. A flashlight in a dark room seems bright, but in the daylight it does not. It is only the darkness that makes the flashlight appear to be brighter than it is. Those are my thoughts in the case of Michael Chambers. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.